It's the most wonderful time of the year, Christmas 2021. Of course, with it being Christmas, there are always going to be some types of controversies that go with the season. We love that here, especially some of the more stupid ones. And we have some absolutely ridiculous cases to talk about tonight. For example, why are people so upset about kids receiving Nerf guns from Santa? People, there's a lot more to get mad about these days. And we have some more substantial arguments. Is Xmas an acceptable abbreviation to Christmas? Does it have an acceptable historical context that overrides the very reality that in the English language, the X does take the Christ out of Christmas? With the power of the written language, what kind of damage does this do to society's uh, concept of the Christmas season? And this leads to the most important aspect of tonight's show, the declining relevancy of Christianity during the celebration of Christmas and the turning of Christmas into a secular commercial holiday. Now, even more worrying, the miracles of the first Christmas are not only declining with regards to its importance to the average American and average Christian, but even in the belief that they are actual historical events. And as we will talk about, belief in the miracles of the first Christmas are just as foundational to the Christian faith as the belief in the miracle of Easter. And last, because it is so important, we'll have a telling of the Christmas story straight from the Bible, straight from a pastor, a uh, very special guest tonight, uh, my father, Matt Basford, no relation. Yeah, funny. Funny. So, Merry Christmas to y'all. Thank you for having me on the show. As now, I guess I'm an officially a canceled misfit, uh, at least for honorarily. Honorarily. He's, he's an honorary one, one yeah. Yeah, honorary, uh, just for tonight anyway. So, I mean, thank you for being on the show. I'm glad I think, to do it. You know, having a professional here definitely will, um, was it, elevate elevate this one uh, in a, many ways. Okay. Oh, yeah, you're a professional okay. speaker. I, I'm something for sure. Anyway, thank you, Gray. I appreciate you having me, and it's my honor to be on your show tonight. Uh, so, you know, what's it, Monday, Christmas is Saturday? I got to ask you, what are some of your favorite Christmas me memories? I know some of them involve me, so go ahead. Yeah. Don't worry about ripping on me too much. No, I won't rip on you. i tell you, one of my favorite Christmas memories was, first of all, Christmas of 1989, a long time before you were around. Um, that, was, that was before the war, right? Back before the yeah. war, right? The big war. The big war. The big war. So, uh, 1989, I hadn't even really known your mom. I'd met your mom, but we certainly weren't dating, but... Uh, the day before Christmas, I was there working my mom's uh, bookstore and Christian's bookstore. And on Christmas Eve, about 3 o'clock, the snow rolled in here in Florida, in Mariana, Florida. And it wow. was blowing hard. I mean, it was just, it was coming down. Uh, like, kind of like the snow used to come down when we lived in Arkansas. And uh, on Christmas Eve and Christmas morning, we had a white Christmas here in Florida. And that's a memory I'll never forget. Um Another one, and you'll you'll love this one. I asked him pre-show if he had any memory of this. I did not. I very did not. barely. Uh, years ago, we were living in Cabot, Arkansas, and Gray and his sister were were pretty young. Um, and there was a place that was a Christmas tree farm uh, near our home, and they were ready to close up shop. They were closing out of business. They'd been there for many many years since the '60s, I suppose, and. So they decided, because they wanted all their Christmas trees clear-cut, that they were going to sell their Christmas trees for the exact same price as they, per foot that they sold them for in 1966. In wow. So it was like five cents a foot or something. So we thought, let's take advantage of this, and we went and picked out a Christmas tree that was bigger than this one. That's that's in, I, Wow. It was probably not quite as tall, but it was bigger around, and half of our living... Well, it was kind of tipped over on the ceiling. <laughs> wasn't, because, the, wasn't the ceiling slanted? It was. It was yeah, kind of yeah, a ball yeah. of the ceiling, but it was tipped over on the top, and then down at the bottom, about a third to a half of our living room was taken up by three, and we still laugh about what, that. What did you bring it home in? Uh, it I could have been your old White Ranger. Yeah, I think it was. I think I kind of tied it on top and then let it lay down in the bed. Yeah, that old Ranger, that... They some good memories in that old oh, thing. I drove it 270, no, 375,000 miles. I think mine's getting close to yours. Yeah, yeah. So, so I know one Christmas um, that we didn't talk about before the show, but I know one that's kind of very important for us was the one back in uh, 2006 mm -hmm. with uh, Brody. So 
I have two younger brothers. Um, one's 10 years younger than me. He was born in 2006. And it could have been a very uh, bad Christmas for our family. So you want to recap some of that? I would, love to, I would love to tell this story. I've told it many times, and I've never gotten through it without um, getting a little emotional, to be honest with you. But early in December, his little brother Brody of 2006, uh, his mom went into labor with him very, very early, very early. He wasn't due until February, and this was early December. So we obviously went to our doctor, and our they put us in the hospital. And because the hospital where we were living at the time did not have a neonatal ICU available, they transferred us to Montgomery, Alabama. And um, we spent the entire month of December, and I know you remember that. Oh, yeah. Uh, we... Separated from our young family. Exactly. My mom helped out so much. Um taking care and try to do the best we could, but I tried to needed to be and stay close to his mom for that. Well, when it got to be about December 22nd, 21st, 22nd, uh, Brody, they, we had successfully kept him from coming out, if you will, and, yeah. and safely. Um, it was to the point where they would accept him at the, the regular nursery at Flowers Hospital in Dothan. So we came home. We, she rode an ambulance back. Our doctors were there. It was just our family was there. We wanted to be home a lot more for Christmas. Support structure and yeah, we wanted to be home for Christmas, so we did that. And we weren't there very long before an emergency sort of situation came up, and he was he had to be delivered surgically, and his lungs were not prepared for that. Now at this point, he was what six weeks early, about roughly, roughly yes, six roughly. Weeks. Uh, and his lungs hadn't developed. I could tell a funny story, but I don't know that it would really be good. Uh, I'll tell it. Hey, after what I said a couple of weeks ago, I don't think anything is uh, over the top. One of my, my wife's two uh, OBGYN doctors was a, a little short black lady named Dr. Torrance. And she was she was a she was a hoot, and we had a good time with her. She was really fun. If Dr. Torrance ever sees this, I'm sure she'll remember because it was Christmas make, Eve. Make sure to send it to her. Yeah, it was Christmas Eve, and Brody had been born, and we were trying to make the decision whether to send him back on the ambulance to Montgomery. And so Dr. Torrance came in, and, and she said, you know, and she's dressed to go. It was Christmas Eve day. She's dressed to go to church. She had her hat on, so you know how... Um, how particular uh, folks are sometimes to go to church on Christmas. And so she's in there and she's trying to explain why we're going to have to send him back because of his lungs. And she made the comment, uh, Reverend Basford, um, you know, if your son Brody were an African-American female, we wouldn't have any problems because African-American females typically do well when they're born early, for yeah. for whatever reason. For whatever reason. I looked at Dr. Torrance, this little black lady, and I said, Dr. Torrance, if he were an African-American female, we'd have a whole different problem. <laughs> she teed it up, and I hit it. <laughs> but anyway. Sometimes you got to do that. Yeah. I, I use humor to... Um, get past some of the some of the stuff so yeah it was, any, it was a terrible it was a terrible time because i remember just from my my perspective i know you got more of the story but from my perspective i remember going back and forth and of course seeing seeing mom in the in in, in the complete in the bed room. rest yeah. yeah complete bed rest you know we were trying to cheer her up some i think we were talking about back like when photoshop was first becoming a thing we got this amazing camera that we were going to take a picture and photoshop her in this nice meadow if i remember correctly. oh wow i don't remember that but that's pretty um, funny but but yeah so like i remember some happy stuff that i remember just you know worry driving back and forth yeah because i mean I, at 10 years old you know i remember taking y'all to target not far from the hospital uh their christmas shopping for mom or whatever and it's, it was a hard time yeah but moving into the, after his birth and he was struggling his chest was cavitating his lungs were just not there yet and so they did on christmas eve decide to send him back to montgomery alabama which is about an hour and a half away from where we lived and so i followed the ambulance now get this when i got the word i was in my suit preparing to preach on sunday morning christmas eve morning and I just said, y'all have to handle it. And I followed the ambulance. I didn't get a toothbrush. I didn't get a change of clothes. And followed the ambulance. Uh, got there. And all day they're processing processing him in. And I'm sitting there watching It's a Wonderful Life. In Talk a, about in a, in a minute. In a hospital waiting room in my suit on Christmas Eve. About 10.30 that night, I finally got in to see him. 
and it's this big room. I want to paint the picture for you. This big room, and each baby has their own nurse and has their own machines that's hooked up to them. And he did. He had he had wires coming out of everywhere, belly button, toes, everything. So we're we're there, and so I'm having to scrub up, and he's not very far away. And I had met his nurse. And by the way, this is Christmas Eve, and her name is Joy, which is hmm. by far no coincidence. Uh, and so I, I'm scrubbing up, and it's about midnight on Christmas Eve, and Joy's standing over there attending to Brody. And so maybe 10 feet away. So I start singing, Oh Holy Night, to myself, a cappella, while I'm scrubbing my hand. And Joy hears me, and being a musician herself, she begins to sing really tight harmony with me. And we sing all the way through Oh Holy Night at midnight on Christmas Eve. And when we got finished, I looked around and all the nurses had stopped doing what they were doing. And the machines were beeping a little bit. But that was really the only sound other than our two voices echoing through that big neonatal ICU singing Oh Holy Night on Christmas Eve. I'll never I'll never forget it till the day I die. It was just a very emotional, very raw, very special Christmas Eve. Yeah. I mean, that, you can see why um, to, with our family, Christmas is such an uh, important holiday. We, we celebrate, the, honestly, the miracle because Brody probably should not have made it out of that NICU. Thankfully, he's a fighter. Uh, he still is, so, you know, got to beat him up from time to time, but... Uh, he wasn't going to let something like underdeveloped lungs stop him from, you know. Well, he finally fired. decided that, that he was done with that Nick unit. He pulled all the <laughs> all the uh, stuff out, yeah. pulled his oxygen out. And so the nurses and doctors said, I think he's telling us he needs to get ready to go home a few days yeah. later. So in the end, it was a blessing, and he is a fighter. Mm-hmm. And so that's good. Yeah. Thank so you Christmas, for yeah. reminding me of that story. Yeah, yeah. Christmas is a, a very important time uh, for us, not just – uh, for the for the memories that we have. I mean, we do have traditions. I know you're saying it's a wonderful life. I think for the past, what, 15 years? Or we, so. Something like that. We watch it every Christmas Eve night. Um, sometimes it bleeds over into Christmas sometimes morning. Sometimes it bleeds over into Christmas morning. Uh, we finally set out the cookies about the cookies and milk about one one thirty in the morning. So, and of course, my sister decides that she likes to... Uh, she likes to wake everyone up at about 6 o'clock in the morning every Christmas... The Christmas uh, she turned 16, she thought she was getting a car. <laughs> and, uh, buddy, we were up way before daylight that morning. Oh, man. And it, I think it's even worse now that she has her own daughter. I think um, it is. Any other Christmas traditions that you can really Well, I, I thought about it. It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, right. We can quote. Um, we I'm can probably the quote the whole movie. Little time off my feet. I'm going to see the world. Uh, yeah. we, we've seen it many, many times. And now we've incorporated his two younger brothers in our tradition. So it yeah. probably will go on. For a long, long time. Yeah. Um, I, as long as they keep playing it before it gets canceled, you know. Yeah, we have, I don't know. In this cancel culture, we, we have a DVD, so they yeah. can't cancel They can't us. cancel our DVD. No, they sure can't.